And John Lee recommends that you take the breath as your home base. This is the meditation topic I use for really getting into the mind. I know some people who've studied in Tibetan traditions, and they say, what are, what's wrong with you Theravadans focusing on the breath? When you die, the breath is going to leave you, and that, at that point, when you most need your meditation object, it's not going to be there. But that ignores the point that when the Buddha teaches breath meditation, it's not just breath. Breath is, of course, the bodily fabrication, gaya sankara. But as in instructions, he also tells you to be sensitive to jitta sankara, or metal fabrication, which are your perceptions and feelings. And the instructions themselves are things you tell yourself. That's vajji sankara, verbal fabrication. And these are the things that you really have to watch out for as you die. But the mind tells itself, images that come into the mind, feelings that can overwhelm the mind. So you've got to be careful. Breath meditation is really good about getting you familiar with these things, so you're not overcome by feelings. So your perceptions don't pull you away in places you would rather, would really, if you had any sense at that point, would really not want to go. The problem is that when you get forced out of that body, you don't feel you have, have much choice. You just grab whatever comes your way. You make your choices under duress. So you want to be really skilled with these things, which is why the breath is the topic that the Buddha taught more than any other meditation topic. He taught it in more detail. But in addition to having your home base, what in Pali they call Vyadadhamma, John Lee recommends that you have what he calls Gojaradhamma, foraging places for the mind. And these are meditation topics you use to deal with specific problems as they come up. One list that's popular in Thailand is called the Guardian Meditations. The recollection of the Buddha, goodwill, contemplation of the foulness of the body, and the recollection of death. And each one of the topics is useful for a different defilement. Recollection of the Buddha is good for when you're feeling doubtful, either about the Dharma or about yourself. You stop and think, who is the person who founded this drama? What kind of person was he? And you realize he was pretty amazing. He had wealth, the potential for power. And he turned his back on that. He said he wanted something better than that. He went out into the forest, studied with two teachers, mastered their skills realized that that wasn't good enough yet. He wanted something that didn't die. That's a pretty audacious desire. In fact, we owe the Dharma to his audacious desire, because he hadn't allowed himself to desire something so out of the ordinary, something so special. We wouldn't have the Dharma we have now. So when he stayed with us, two of John's, and realized that what they taught didn't lead to the deathless, he then submitted himself to six years of austerity to see if he could squeeze the mind away from pleasure. And so how gain awakening that way? He realized that that didn't work. This is by way he said he realized that he had pursued austerities more than anybody else. And that could have become a point of pride. But still, he didn't let his pride over that get in the way of his original desire, which was to find something deathless. So then he tried the path of the jhanas, and then adding on to the, the jhanas, he finally arrived at the Eightfold Path. And that way he gained awakening. You read in his biography how he tested his awakening. The texts say that he spent six weeks, excuse me, seven weeks 
experiencing the bliss of awakening, the bliss of release. But there are passages where he also talks about how he looked at his awakening from many different angles to see if there could possibly be anything lacking. And he realized there wasn't. So everything he did, he put to the test. Even when awakening came, he put that to the test. That's the kind of person we're, we're dealing with here. Someone who's very true, in fact. The truthfulness of his character stands out more than anything else. It informs his wisdom, it informs his purity, and it informs his compassion. The virtues that are traditionally attributed to him. But he's a very true person. It requires someone who's true like that to find the truth. So contemplating the Buddha that way, if you have doubts about the Dhamma, it helps to overcome those doubts. The problem with thinking about how amazing the Buddha was sometimes gets in the way of the other way in which you can use the contemplation of the Buddha, a recollection of the Buddha, to overcome doubt. And that's when you have doubts about yourself. You look at the Buddha and he seems so impossibly beyond where you are that it gets discouraging. That's when you have to realize he was a human being. And he made mistakes. You think about the Buddha is a little bit beyond the range of what you think is possible. Well, think about the members of the Sangha. You read the verses of the Tarigata and Tarigata. And you find people who were pretty desperate. There's one monk who talks about how in the many years he was ordained, he only got a finger snap worth of metal calm. There's another monk who found that his mind would settle down and then it would unravel, settle down, unravel. He did that seven times. In both cases, those monks got suicidal. But then they came to their senses. And we were able to get past that depression and finally attain awakening. You have to tell yourself, if they could do it, you can do it too. In fact, that's a, an attitude that Venerable Ananda encourages. It's a form of conceit. But it's useful in the path. As he said, we practice to overcome conceit, but we need at least this much conceit that we feel that they're human beings, you're a human being. They can do it, you can do it too. The Buddha himself encourages a similar form of conceit when he talks about renunciate pain. He notices that we tend to live in household pleasure, household pain, household equanimity. We get things we like and we're, we're happy. We get things we don't like, we're unhappy. We decide to be neutral about things. We can do that for a while. But then we go back to being happy and unhappy about things of the senses. And the Buddha says the best response to household pain is renunciate pain, thinking that there are people who've attained awakening. I haven't gotten there yet. It's painful in the sense that you realize there's a goal that has to be attained, and there's going to be work to do it. But it's useful. The Buddha wasn't the sort of person who said, well, having goals is oppressive to you, so you just don't have goals. They may work on a weekend meditation retreat, when people sometimes put themselves under too much pressure. But for a lifetime practice, it doesn't work at all. And you look at the Buddha, he definitely had goals. So that's a pain we have to go through. And it's a pain that comes with conceit. I've got something I want that other people have, but I don't have it. But that, the Buddha says, is an attitude to be actively encouraged. So when you think about the Buddha, think about the Dharma and the Sangha as well. And again, it's 
a balancing act, because sometimes you want to think about how amazing the Dharma is and how amazing the members of the Sangha are. Think about a John Munn, who pretty much single-handedly, together with a John Sow, the two of them, founded the forest tradition in the face of a lot of opposition from the ecclesiastical authorities and from ordinary people around them. Said they were being too extreme. They weren't following Thai customs, Lao customs, but they were determined. Here's an opportunity to find the deathless. Let's go for it. So we think about how amazing they are as a way of inspiring us that this is a really good path we're on. But then if they get so amazing that you feel that you are weak in comparison, you've got to back off a little bit and remind yourself, well, they were human beings. We read their biographies, and there is a tendency in Thailand when you write a, the biography of an Ajahn to say only the good things about him, which makes them seem impossibly determined, impossibly resilient. Their autobiographies I find a little bit more more approachable, because they will tell you they had these weaknesses, they had these doubts, they had these problems, and they overcame them. So inspire yourself that way. So whichever form of doubt you have, tailor your recollection of the Buddha together with the Dharma and the Sangha to overcome that particular doubt. And then you can get back to the breath. You foraged around for a while. Now it's the time to come back home with renewed confidence that what you're doing here is a good thing and you can do it. That's what that particular recollection is for.